Hello, and welcome to another video in my Fundamentals of Orchestration series. Today, I'll look at arranging piano music for the brass section of the orchestra. I've composed several short piano excerpts that I'll arrange in several contrasting versions to demonstrate orchestration concepts and techniques. I'll be using the Berlin Brass sample libraries from orchestral tools to help in my demonstrations. Let's get started. A few quick thoughts before I dive into the first example. I'll mostly stick to the standard orchestral brass section. That's three trumpets in C, four horns in F, two tenor trombones, a bass trombone, and one tuba. These examples will obviously include subsets of that, but for the most part I won't add additional instruments, as this series is focused primarily on the modern orchestra. I also think that young composers and arrangers often feel the need to add way more brass instruments than necessary, and you'll hopefully see in this video that this standard setup is certainly capable of supplying the power and force associated with this section. Having said that, because so many of these additional brass instruments have been sampled, I will include one or two examples that utilize instruments like the euphonium, bass trumpet, and contrabass trombone. One last thought before I get started, the modern orchestral score order places the horns above the trumpets, and this can lead to some confusion among young orchestrators. We might assume that this score order should reflect the register order from high to low, and that's mostly true, but not the case here. There's some historical precedence here, and horns above trumpets in the score goes back a few hundred years, even though trumpets are generally given the higher pitches. So let's take a look at the first example, which features a classical progression of homophonic chords in the key of E minor. This example will allow us to consider vertical pitch ordering in the brass section. Here's what it sounds like on piano. As always, when looking at piano music, you must keep in mind the limitations of the piano or pianist, and then decide how best to translate that music to the new instrument or set of instruments. Here you have to decide whether or not to expand the chord voicing inward. In other words, should you fill in the large gap between the left and right hand? In this case, the answer is probably yes, since we're not limited to just two hands. And in order to achieve a forte dynamic, we should fill in the vertical gap. One other thing to consider here is how to achieve the diminuendo. Overall volume in the orchestra is determined by several factors. How many players are playing, what instruments are playing, what register those instruments are playing in, the dynamic marking, and so on. All of those things play a role in how the audience hears loudness. So in this example, you want to create a dynamic shift from forte to piano, and the registral shape of the line actually facilitates this because these chords move inward to where it's much easier for brass instruments to play softly. You then have to determine which instruments you want to use and where those instruments will play. The easiest solution is to use the same register as the piano, but there are times when you might consider moving things up or down by an octave. Let's take a look at my first version of this. I'll break this down by instrument type, starting with the lowest notes I gave that bottom line to the tubas and the octave above to the bass trombone. The tenor trombones can start filling in that gap in register right above the bass trombones in closed voicing. Starting in the third measure, as the progression moves inward, I fill in the gap between the bottom two notes in the left hand of the piano. Because this is now a softer dynamic level, intervals of thirds in this range can actually be effective. If it were marked forte, you'd run the risk of thirds sounding muddy in this octave. But as we get quieter, it will sound dark, but not too muddy. Jumping up to the trumpets, I gave them the top three notes of the right-hand piano chords. That leaves us with the horns, and I gave them the notes between trumpets and trombones. And because horns aren't quite as powerful as trumpets or trombones, I had them grouped into pairs with two horns on a note together. I make certain that when the dynamics get softer, each instrument group has notes in a part of their respective register that is effective at a low dynamic level. Let's hear how this sounds. Here's a slightly darker sounding version, and I haven't really changed all that much. I'm using the same instruments in the same order from high to low, but the main difference is the chord voicing in the low octave. I moved the bass trombone down so they're now a fifth above the tubas in the first chord, 
Then in the fourth chord, as the overall dynamics decrease, I move the tubas down an octave, which will help darken the sound quite a bit. At that point, the bass trombone is now an octave above the tuba, and the tenors are in closed voicing right above that. Because there's now a slightly larger gap between trumpets and trombones, I have horns between them, each horn on their own note. Individually, these notes won't be as strong in the horn, but I think it's more important to fill in the entire register. Here's what this version sounds like. The next example is somewhat similar to the first, with a more 19th or 20th century sounding harmonic language. Let's give this a listen on the piano. Similar to the first example, this one also sort of moves inward registrally from start to finish. But unlike the first example, there's more of a clear melodic line that you might want to emphasize in the orchestration. So here's the first version of the orchestration. I chose to divide the melody into two parts with three trumpets in unison on the first part and two horns in unison on the second. I did this because of the registral shift in the melody. The first half is better suited to trumpets and three trumpets at forte in this register will be commanding and powerful. But as the melody moves down, especially in the fourth measure, I think it better suits the horn, as the trumpets down here would be less focused and a bit too aggressive sounding. I wanted to create a timbral shift as well, so we start with the brighter, bolder, intense sound of the trumpets, and we move towards a warmer, more rounded sound in the last measure. As for the trombones and tubas, I gave the lowest part to the tubas, and then sort of filled in the gap with the bass and tenor trombones. Once again, I used closer spaced chords towards the end when I want a warmer sound. Let's give this a listen. This next version has the same trombone and tuba parts, but I've sort of switched the trumpets and horns. So now the horns have the first part of the melody, essentially the right hand of the piano exactly, and then the trumpets enter on the second half of the melody up the octave, with the horns supporting the trumpets underneath. It's slightly different overall, but I think both orchestrations are effective. Here's what this one sounds like. And just for fun, I decided to make one more version of this example using a late 19th century instrumentation with expanded section size and a few additional instruments. I was somewhat limited to which instruments I could use because of what samples are available in my orchestral tools collection, so I settled on six horns, three trumpets, a bass trumpet, two tenor trombones, a bass trombone, a contrabass trombone, a euphonium, and a tuba. Started to seem a little bass heavy, so I probably should have added more high horns or trumpets, but again, I was a bit restricted. For this example, I also decided to transpose up a fifth, as I could then have trumpets much higher to start, and I then had more instruments to fill in the larger gap. The second half of the melody is now fairly high for the horns, but I suppose I was going for that Wagnerian or Howard Shore sound here, so I put three horns on that line, with the rest harmonizing below. I used a bass trumpet as an extension of the trumpet in C downward, and I used euphonium as an extension of tuba an octave above. I decided to only bring in the contrabass trombone on the last two measures, and honestly it's so low down there that I have a hard time even hearing it. I really think overall this version showed me that you don't really need these extra instruments, at least when using sample libraries in a digital mix. But here's what it sounds like. The next example is quite a bit different than the first two. Here we have a series of parallel seventh chords forming melodic material in the right hand, with a contrasting chromatic line in octaves in the left hand. Here's what it sounds like in piano. Mm -hmm. 
even though this music may look more complicated, it's actually quite a bit more simple to orchestrate than the previous examples. With four notes per chord in the right hand, horns seem like the obvious choice. Not only would the range work, but timbrally, the horns fill that mysterious sound better than either trumpets or trombones, I think, although that is somewhat subjective. I think that the melodic line in the left hand would be more fitting on tuba than on trombones, and the timbre of the tuba is closer to the horns anyway, as both instruments are conical. Here's how this orchestration sounds. Here's another version, almost the exact same thing, but I've added euphonium doubling tuba and octave above, so that I get both octaves from that original piano part. Obviously, euphonium isn't a standard orchestral instrument, but it blends more easily with the tuba in this lyrical setting. Here's the last version of this example, and I was going for a much fuller brass sound overall. I decided that the easiest way to do this would be to expand the range upward so that trumpets and trombones would carry the right-hand piano material. Transposing up an octave would put the trumpets in much too high of a register, so I chose to transpose up by a sixth. Even here, the first trumpet has to enter on a high F at a piano dynamic, which is very difficult for most players, but I also had to make sure that the last chord was high enough for the third trumpet, as the gesture spans quite a large range, making it difficult to orchestrate for anything other than horns. I treat trombones as a lower extension of trumpets, and I group horns and tuba together on the left-hand piano material. Here's what that sounds like. The next example features a much faster tempo, a staccato pulsating right hand, and a syncopated somewhat melodic left hand. If you're familiar with the music of John Adams, this is essentially a texture that you might find in one of his symphonic or operatic works. Here's what the piano version sounds like. With the first version, I gave the right-hand piano material to the trumpets and horns, with the horns positioned just below the trumpets. That leaves the low brass with the left-hand material. I basically copy-pasted note for note. Here's what this sounds like. In this next version, the only thing that I've changed is the horns now have sforzando piano sustains with crescendos to the next measure. The horns have the same note in the same range, but with a more contrasting articulation and texture. So now they attack the note strongly and immediately diminuendo to get out of the way of the rest of the section. This sforzando piano articulation also allows them to crescendo back to the forte for each new chord. It helps drive the music forward with a sense of urgency and motion. Here's what that sounds like. The next example features a more light-hearted adventure-type theme with a strong 6-8 feel. There's a simple triadic left hand that sits underneath a right-hand melody in F minor. Here's what the piano version sounds like. In this first orchestration, I basically copy-pasted the individual components of the piano version into the brass section. I placed the left-hand triadic material in the horns, the melody in two unison trumpets, and the low downbeat in measure one, as well as the eighth notes leading into the seventh measure in the bass trombone and tuba an octave apart. This version is very melody-focused, meaning there's not a lot getting in the way of the trumpets. The horns are great at sitting into the background with this light-hearted accompanimental pattern. It's not until the end where we get a thicker, brassier sound with the bass trombone and tuba. Here's what it sounds like. In the next version, I kept the melody in the trumpets, but split the accompaniment into two parts. The quicker dotted beginning and end accompanimental pattern is in the horns, but shifted up an octave. This creates a greater sense of urgency in this range, but in order to stay balanced underneath the melody, it needs to come down to the original octave. I have the horns drop down, and then the accompaniment transitions to trombones. <laughs> 
I increased the activity of the tuba in the middle of this example, so now the tuba plays tonic eighth notes on the strong beats underneath the accompaniment. Even though this wasn't in the piano version, it's really just taking the eighth note accompaniment pattern and shifting the tonic notes down an octave. So here's what this version sounds like. In the last version of this example, I decided to give the melody to the first trombone. But in order to do this, I decided to transpose the music down by a fourth. The first trombone is now an octave and a fourth below the original, putting it in a strong part of its register. The other low brass instruments play the accompaniment pattern below the melody, and the opening and ending accompaniment figures are once again in the horns and trumpets. Because I moved this music down a fourth, it gave me an opportunity to play with the octave register on this opening material. So the trumpets start in the highest octave now, and the horns come in a measure later down the octave, and then trombones down yet another octave. It creates an interesting timbral shift, and I like how the initial intense dramatic music shifts towards the more lighthearted trombone music. Here's what that sounds like. The next example features a romantic melody over an eighth note pianistic left hand texture. The melody and harmonic language are very reminiscent of works by late 19th or early 20th century symphonists like Mahler, or certainly film composers like John Williams. The biggest challenge here is in determining how to translate the left hand material for the brass section. In both my Piano to Strings and Piano to Winds videos, there were several options for translating this kind of pianistic texture but it's a bit trickier with brass instruments. It's an arrange that would be suitable for trombones, but the trombone timbre and legato doesn't seem to fit this music. I think the best option would be to split the left hand up into several instruments, each instrument sustaining notes longer than an eighth note, but each one offset so that you can maintain a sense of an eighth note pulse. Let's first hear the piano version. So in my first version of this, I give the melody to a solo horn, as it seems an obvious choice, given the range and stylistic character. I chose to stick with only conical instruments, so that means horns and tuba. And these instruments give us a warmer, more rounded sound. I gave the lowest notes to the tuba, and notice that I gave the tuba time to breathe in beat 4 of measures 1 through 3, and that's for two reasons. One, it's always a good idea to give them a chance to breathe, but also if you look at the left hand of the piano, the fourth beat sort of hints at the dominant harmony, and I wanted to stay away from the tonic in that moment. In terms of the eighth note left hand texture, I tried to balance having an eighth note pulse with not getting too active with the instruments. The piano is really good at playing background eighth notes, but this isn't really the case with low horns. So there's some sense of motion, but it's not taking the attention away from the soloist. Here's what that sounds like. In the next version of this example, I added a second horn in unison on the melody, and added in trombones accompanying underneath the horns. I also reinforced the bass notes by adding in bass trombone, with tuba and octave below. It's a much fuller, richer timbre overall, and although everyone's still marked piano, there's obviously a much bigger sound here. This goes back to earlier when I was discussing how we perceive loudness. In this case, adding more instruments in and lowering the register makes it louder overall even when the dynamic marking is the same. So here's what that sounds like. 
example features three parts. The first is a series of chromatically rising whole notes. The second is the pedal B eighth notes on the offbeats. And the third is the collection of more active melodic gestures in the middle of each measure in octaves. In piano, this example sounds sort of like tango music, but as you'll soon see, it sounds very different with brass. Let's hear the piano version first. In this first orchestration, I gave the whole notes to the horns, the low pedal notes to the trombones, and the active melodic gestures to the trumpets. The horn whole notes are marked forte piano, so you'd hear the attack and then they'd back off, allowing the trumpets to cut through more easily. There are two trumpets on the upper octave and the third trumpet on the lower octave. As you'll hear, the brass version of this sounds a lot less like tango music and more like something out of a James Bond movie. It's an example of how orchestration and instrument choice really affects the overall character of the music. Here's what this version sounds like. <laughs> The next version is essentially the same, but with the horns now playing stopped notes. This makes the timbre buzzier and a bit quieter, so to balance this I removed the lower octave trumpet. The result is a much thinner sound. And the final version is very similar once again. I've added back in the lower octave trumpet, and I have the horns now with crescendos into each measure. I've also filled out the harmony in the horns, so instead of just octaves, I've given them triads. I've also added the tuba, doubling with the bass trombone. Here's what that sounds like. I have just two more examples in this video. The first is sort of in a fanfare-like style in D, although the tonality is somewhat more ambiguous than previous examples. It features parallel chords in the right hand moving by seconds, fourths, and fifths up and down, and a sort of driving eighth note left hand moving mostly in contrasting motion to the right hand. Here's what the piano version sounds like. In the first orchestration of this example, I've given the right hand material to the trumpets and horns in that order from high to low, and the left hand material is divided up between the low brass. I played around with the syncopation a bit in the left hand material so that trombones and tuba have sort of a back and forth dialogue between them. It's a bit more interesting if you can find a clever way to divide this material so long as the individual instrument parts still work on their own. You want to avoid completely random rhythms in any given instrument part, it'll just confuse the players. So here's what this version sounds like. <laughs> In this next version, I've sort of flipped the role of the horns and tenor trombones, so now the tenor trombones are with the trumpets, pitched just below them. Horns have a rhythmically much simpler part, sort of in line with the tuba. And the bass trombone is essentially the same as before, maintaining that playful rhythmic dialogue between it and the tuba. Here's what it sounds like. <laughs> In this last version in this example, I kept it mostly the same, but I had the trombones and trumpets play with straight mutes. I also simplified the horn part, removing their eighth notes in measure two, and added a stopped articulation to their notes. This is similar in timbre to playing with a mute, so it fits timbrally with the trumpets and trombones. Here's what this sounds like. <laughs> So one final example today, this one is sort of inspired by jazz music, as well as music by the composer Scriabin. I think the sustained chords here work really well for brass, but deciding how to translate the quintuplet is a bit more challenging. Here's what the piano version sounds like. So as I said, dealing with that quintuplet is a challenge. I chose to try and capture the essence of that tuplet, meaning the notes and contour, but not the exact rhythm. I think it would be too difficult to have the instruments play the original line verbatim, so simplifying the line is probably for the best. So let's give this a listen. <laughs> <laughs> 
next version, I simplified the parts even more, eliminating the sweeping gesture from the horns and giving them stopped articulations. I've made the trumpets and trombones play with straight mutes and removed tuba entirely. While you can technically add a mute to a tuba, and many professional tuba players will in fact have mutes, uh, it's sort of a hassle for them and really not worth it in my opinion. So here's what this version sounds like. And here's the final version. I've kept everything the same, but changed the mutes from straight mute to harmon mute. You can play harmon mutes with the stem inserted or not inserted, and I've indicated stem in. Here's what this one sounds like. So that's it for the examples today. Before I end the video, I just want to mention that I'll be uploading the MIDI files and MP3s of individual audio stems for all of these examples for anyone to download for free. Just click on the link in the description box for this video. This is sort of a preview of what I want to start offering regularly for every video I make via Patreon. I'll be starting a Patreon page very soon, and I'll be making a video explaining all of the different tiers and perks for that. Thank you so much for all of the support already, and I'm really looking forward to growing my channel and offering new types of videos and composer tutorials. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. Next up will be one or two videos on the orchestral percussion section, and then I'll be diving into full orchestra, which I'm really excited about. So thanks again, and see you next time.